right, so make sure you've got your lesson there in Shobi so you can take some notes. All right, so lesson eight, the last encounter of David and Saul. First Samuel chapter 26 is where we're going to begin doing some of the reading here. First Samuel chapter 26. Follow along here, verse, first few verses here. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hekelah, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having three thousand chosen men of Israel with him, to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Hekelah, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul was come in very deed. And, Saul, and David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David held the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David, and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zariah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me? to Saul, to the camp. And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and, Abish, and Abishai came to the people by night. And behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite thee, I pray thee, with a spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said furthermore, As the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they gat them away. No man saw it, nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. This encounter with Saul, Bible historians approximate, is a year and a half after David had come into contact with Saul at the cave. Okay? So we know that at the end of that time, Saul had said some things about David and admitted some things about him and said, you know, that he wouldn't bother again. But we know that's not true. Saul had in his heart, his heart was a hard heart, and he desired to kill David. Okay? So once again, Saul is acting here as though a monster. So Saul receives news from some people, the men of Ziph, the Ziphites. Hey, David is over here. We know you're looking for him. Why don't you come and get him? So they have alerted Saul to David's location. So Saul sets out to march after him. They go up and into the mountain and the hill, hillside and the hilly areas by the mountains. And they begin to search through them looking for David. Now David, he also hears, he gets word that Saul is near. And so they retreated. They took off and they retreated into some type of desert area, we read. But then they also probably sent out some men as lookouts to confirm, do you see Saul and his men coming? And those lookouts confirmed to David that, yes, he is coming. So then David asked two of his bravest men, Ahimelech and Abishai, will you go with me? Let, let us go down to the camp of Saul. Okay? And let's go spy out and see what's going on there. Well, we don't read anything about Ahimelech going, but Abishai did. Okay? And as they're probably creeping over the mountains and looking out over for where Saul and his men are camped, okay, they begin to notice a few things. Okay, they find him. They see that Saul and his men are getting ready to go to bed. They're probably crouched up in the hills, making sure none of Saul's lookouts can see them. But they're moving and creeping along carefully and slowly, probably some type of camouflage at this point at least. Okay. Now, that evening... David observes, along with, along with Abishai, Saul falls asleep. So when it becomes dark, they creep down probably the hillside, 
and probably go up another hill. And they come up to the edge of the camp where Saul and his men are encamped here. Okay. We might say, was this not foolish? I mean, wasn't he going to get caught? Isn't this dangerous? What is David thinking? What is he doing? But he's not. David trusts here. In this situation, David trusts in the Lord to watch over him. He knows God is with him. Okay. So they get there at night. Everyone is uh, sleeping. And uh, there's, we can only imagine. You know, do they tiptoe in amongst the rocks, amongst the men? Uh, did they not? Was there no brush for them to crack a twig and wake anyone up? But then we read at the end, the Lord is working here. The Lord has caused a deep sleep to fall over Saul, Abner, and all of Saul's men, so that they will not awake when Abishai and David are there. Okay? Saul had with him his kingly spear, which was his scepter at this time during the time of war. And there was a cruise of water, a jug, a pot that Saul would have had just personally for himself to be able to make sure that he, that he stayed hydrated, that uh, out here in this desert, in this mountainous dry region, he didn't run out of water. Now, while they are there, right, you can imagine them with Saul lying on the ground, snoring away a few feet from them, Abishai whispering into the ears of David, My Lord, let me take this spear, and with one thrust I will thrust it through the heart of Saul, and we will kill him, we will destroy him here, no longer will he search and come after you, my Lord. Let me do it now. Abishai is probably thinking about himself, his own glory, his own fame that he would receive for this, the high place that he would have in David's, uh, in David's kingdom when David would become king. But David says no. David did not hesitate. He didn't even question for a minute. No, this is the Lord's anointed. And he even gives three ways in which David, uh, or that Saul might die. Okay? Uh, and David said, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth against the Lord's anointed? As the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or the day shall come to die, so die of old age or whatever, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord will take his life from him, but not you and not me. We aren't the ones that should be doing this, he says to Abishai. So what do they do? They grab the jug, they grab the spear, tiptoe their way out of the camp, back down the hill, probably back up another mountainous hill, and then they lie far, far away in wait across the great, that great divide that they had crossed so that when the morning would come, there's no way any of Saul's men could quickly scramble down the hill and scramble up to try to get David. It would be impossible. We don't read that any did, but we probably can be sure that they did. All right, so let's see now what is the result. So David has a spear. He's got the jug. He's on, a, he's on another uh, mountainside far away from Saul. And now they are sitting there waiting. What are they waiting for? What happens next? Verse 13. Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great space being between them. And David cried to the people in Abner to the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people to destroy the king, my lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this the voice of my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let the Lord, the king, hear the words of, of his servant. If the Lord hath stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out of this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. So, when the morning sun comes up, the men in the camp of Saul begin to rustle around and move, begin waking up. Abner is one of them that wakes up right away, and David calls out to him. He doesn't call out to Saul right away. David calls out to Abner. Abner, who is King Saul's right-hand man. Okay? And... It's his duty 
as the king's personal guard to make sure that the king is always guarded and watched over. David, it says, though, he, he teases him here. Okay? Abner, uh, and so all the other men by now are woken up, so they know a man's calling out, and, and David makes fun of Abner as though it was here. Aren't you the one who's famous for being a brave man in Israel? You're the captain of the king's guard, his bodyguard, the keeper of his life. But last night you failed to give orders for a man to stay awake with him all night. You failed too. Someone came into your camp and could have killed the king. And here we will prove it. Look, here are the spear and the water jug. And he holds them up so that all the men in the camp of Saul can see that Abner has failed to do his duty. And David says, you are worthy of death, Abner. If Saul had his mind to it right there, he would have killed Abner. That was the duty. That was the punishment for not guarding the king. Now Saul at this time recognizes the voice of David and says to him, Hey, is this the voice of my son David? And David answers, Yes. He calls him, My lord, O king. Because David is showing proper respect here uh, for the king. But then he rebukes him. Okay? Uh, you are, and he, he teaches him a few things. Saul, you're still responsible for your sin. Okay? You should be offering here on this mountain a lamb as an offering to the Lord. That's what you should be doing. Confess your sin. Say you are sorry for it. Leave it here. And ask God to take away your sins. So David here shows David or Saul what he should have done. But he didn't. Saul, the one who is hunting David, who desires to kill him. David asks him, don't hunt me anymore. I'm as harmless as a flea or a mountain partridge, a small bird. I don't do anything to harm you, Saul. What have I done? There's nothing you can, there's nothing you can say I've done. There's nothing that you can accuse me of. I've done no wrong. Saul's answer here is interesting. Verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spear, <coughs> and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered thee into my hand today. But I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things, and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. So, what happens here? Saul admits he was sinful. He wishes he hadn't done it, and yet he doesn't ask for forgiveness. He's not truly sorrowful. How many times haven't we done something wrong at home, maybe to mom and dad or a little brother or sister, and we regretted it later on? But how many times haven't we also done something and we've gotten in trouble for it, and even though we were punished, we weren't really sorry for it. I'm glad that still happened. Oh, I might be. I might have got a spanking, or I might have got a grounding, or I might have lost a person, but I'm still glad that I got him real good at that time. That's Saul's heart right here. He's sorry. He, he's sorry that he he got caught. Hey, okay? he's admitted. Yes, what I did was wrong, but he doesn't ask for forgi for forgiveness. He doesn't do that. Saul and David will never meet again. They will never see each other again. They're done. The Lord now will never let their paths cross. And we need to see how David is setting both Saul up to learn a lesson here and David to learn a lesson. And that's what we see in this uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 27. Follow along there, the first seven verses. David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. And David arose, and he passed over with the six hundred men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. 
And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country, that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of Philistines was, was a full year and four months. And then we read there, verse 8, And David his men went up and invaded the Gerishites and the, and the Gezrites and the Amalekites, for these nations were the old of old the inhabitants of the land. So, what happens? Saul, or I'm sorry, David fails to trust the Lord. He was so trustful of the Lord when he went creeping up that mountain into Saul's camp. But now we see already David lacks the trust in the Lord because he says, One day I shall perish from the hand of Saul. Even the Lord, even though God had just protected him. Okay? So, David and his men, the 600 men with him, they move to the land of the Philistines. They go to see King Achish, their enemy. Okay? He takes his two wives with him. Okay? And, well, Achish welcomes David. Now, why does he do that? Well, it's in God's providence here, but maybe he thinks David will be on his side. Maybe he thinks, by having David close around me, he won't be attacking me and the Philistines anymore and destroying us. I'll keep him around about, and if he tries to leave, maybe I'll kill him. But for whatever reason, Achish gives David and his men permission to stay there in the capital city. And David is safe. Okay? Uh, Saul didn't have to chase him because now David is out of the land of Israel, but Saul's not going to do that anyways. Now, David starts out living in the royal city with King Achish, but he soon finds that he would like to be out from under the eye of King Achish. He would like a little freedom. So he asks the king, is there not a country city where me and my men could live? And the king says, well, sure, why don't you head down to the city of Ziklag? That would be a good city for you to live in. <coughs> so King Achish is still thinking, I can keep an eye on David and whatever he's doing and not have to worry about that. David and his men move down to Ziklag. Now, David here is living a lie. Now, first of all, he's not in the land that he should be, the land of, of Israel. But something else happens here. The king of Ziklag expects David to be on his side. He expects David to go out and raid into the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Go after them and destroy your own people. David lives a lie. He is going out raiding, but not into his own people. Rather, he's going out into other little lands and countries there. Hey, we read the Geshurites, the, Ger or the Gezrites, and the Amalekites. He goes to them. He destroys little towns and bits and pieces there, and he takes the spoils, and that way he can take them back and show the king, see, look what I'm doing, King Achish. I'm fighting, and I'm gathering all of these, all of these things up. So it keeps David safe. For a year and four months, we read, that David lived here in Ziklag. Okay? They were dependent on, this, on Ziklag or King Achish. Uh, David is living a lie. He's planning... Uh, that the king won't find out because David is destroying each of these towns completely that he goes into and raids. So there's no way for King Achish to find out that he's not really raiding into the lands of Judah or Israel. That's a lie. There will be, as a result of that lie, there will be a consequence for David and also for the men of Ziklag. David has caused trouble, we'll see in our next lesson, for the men of Ziklag and also for himself. And we saw sermon yesterday. The foolishness okay, of the lie. How hurtful and destructive it can be. And here it is once more that the lie is very destructive. So we can be honest and truthful in our lives too. The way of a lie shows a lack of trust in the Lord. That's all it really shows. Our heart doesn't totally and completely trust the Lord that He will do what's right for us. I'm going to get a punishment for my activities. I'll lie to my parents or to my teacher, whoever. And that way I can get out of my punishment. No trust in the Lord. Mom and dad, teacher, grandpa, grandma, whoever. I did do it. And I accept whatever punishment may come, although it may temporarily hurt me, it will help me in the long run. So we can learn those things here from David. So David and Saul have seen each other for the last time. And tomorrow, or in our next lesson, we'll see the end of Saul's life as well as 
what happens uh, with David and his men after that. <coughs> all right. You should also be working through your uh, worksheets up there.